How's everyone doing? Yeah, isn't this a great day for spreading ideas? And we've had some amazing speakers, and I'm here to tell you it's going to get better. I mean, lunch is coming up. Um, you ever wonder what a TED conference might have looked like 2,500 years ago? At the height of the golden age in ancient Greece? Mr. Plato, my talk today concerns about how all poets in the Republic should be killed. Mr. Plato, you had that talk last year. No, last year I was of the opinion they should be banished. Euripides, put that stone down. Socrates made me do it. How about at the court of Elizabeth of England? She was surrounded by some of the best minds, for sure. Mr. Shakespeare, please stop using iambic pentameter. We have a headache. How about Aubrey de Vere, the Earl of Oxford? His TED talk would have been, I'm here to talk about plagiarism. Yes, William, I mean you. How many of those ideas worth spreading 2,500 years ago or 500 years ago would have still been worth spreading today? I want you to think about that for the next 31 minutes as I speak. No, of course not. I, the lunch is, is important. Um, my personal story starts here in Bucharest with my parents isolating me and creating a barrier around me with arts against communism. There were movies, but there were, of course, books. There, were, there was music. I had no idea I was going to use it in any way, any of these arts, as a profession. They were just what was a wall between me, between any of us in our generation who grew up before 1989, and the world outside, where if you told a political joke in school, one of your own 12-year-old classmates might tell on you, and this happened to us. So we, we defended ourselves in and with arts. And oftentimes, I remember my parents and I would take socks and pillowcases and stuff them into the door jams and into the windowsills so that the neighbors couldn't hear that we were watching uh, a movie, a foreign movie. So we had a black market of VHS tapes. And for many of us, this was the biggest, mo most exciting thing that could happen to us. Oh my god, I'm going to get to see a movie. And in my case, this led to my auditioning and being in a couple of movies with communist pioneers and helping the authorities nab the bad guys. And there's a bunch of clips on the internet of me, chubby and young and with a red scarf pointing at the bad guys. And you're all invited to never, please, never look for those clips. Um, but what that led to was a very interesting situation in high school for me when I uh, remember the director of my high school come to me and he was white as a sheet and said, this is a security officer, a secret police officer waiting for you from the cultural division of Comrade One. That was the president, Nikolai Ceausescu. And, and uh, so I had to meet him and in the director's office and the man formally invited me to recite poetry in front of the president on his birthday. And of course this was horrifying and I didn't quite know what the consequences of saying no would be, so I was silent. And he interpreted his, my silence encouragingly and said, okay, I'll come back next week and I'll ask you again. So he did, which was a mistake because he gave me the time to prepare myself. And I said, Comrade Ceausescu tells us we should study mathematics and physics and make conscious, responsible choices about our careers and be lawyers and doctors, or well, not lawyers, but doctors and scientists and engineers and none of this arts is important. I quit acting which worked. He knew he, he'd, been, he'd been taken. It's funny that acting actually took it, but um, there was truth in what I'd said. I realized I was preparing or contemplating um, a career in self-expression in a country of mass repression. That's not an iambic pentameter on the record. It's just fewer syllables. And so I turned my attention to math and physics like everyone else, which led to my eventually going to MIT on a, on a scholarship. Uh, which was extremely exciting for a you know, young Romanian. And uh, the shock was when I got there, and they said, they was, I was a transfer student, I did two years here, and they looked at my transcript and they said, oh, great, so you have all your basic science classes, you're going to have to take a lot of humanities courses. And I'm like, what? Humanities course? I came to MIT, I'm going to be a physicist. And I said, yeah, 
but you didn't have to take all these humanities courses. That's the first time I encountered the difference in, in the education systems on a university level between Europe and America. So I ended up having to take film theory and harmony and counterpoint and other things that l naturally led to me eventually quitting my PhD and going to get a Master of Fine Arts in filmmaking from USC. But thank you, MIT, anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to show you the, 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 the I'm getting to the point. Um, so I, get, I go to USC, I graduate, and I get into documentaries, not quite sure why. I think that it had to do with the fact that I have to now study the world, the brave new world I'm in. I mean, it's, I felt very American the first couple of years I was there. And then the, my, the supply of my knowledge about America that I've, I'd learned from those BHS tapes kind of ran out. And I had to be confronted with the reality of being in a strange country that I didn't know much about. And being a filmmaker, documentary seemed the perfect opportunity to, to practice my profession and learn about what I was doing, because documentarians are constantly driven by a feeling of discovery and curiosity. So I was extremely lucky, and I ended up, five years ago, being involved with a project uh, called the Hobart Shakespeareans. Let's see if this works. Yes. Uh, it's about a professor, a teacher, fifth grade. These are 11 year old kids. He teaches at one of the poorest schools in America. It's, there are so many students, it runs in three shifts like a factory. And there are no um, white or black faces. There are mostly Koreans and Central Americans, many of them from undocumented um, immigrant parents who don't speak English at home. And he takes them and uses Shakespeare as both a means and an end. Wow, I guess this works. Um, and within one year, w only one year, teaches them for only one year, he gets them to the top percentile in the nation, and they get to stage a full-length Shakespeare play. And they get to learn about 10 other monologues and about 10 sonnets. And they know them. They really know them. I mean, my mother's an actress, my father's a playwright. I grew up in the theater. I didn't understand Hamlet until an 11-year-old Hispanic boy in LA explained it to me in his own words. That's how good that teacher is, that he could teach it to him, that he could teach it to me. And I said, okay, this is all great, this is all great. Rafe is a maverick media mentor, okay? These kids who have no, okay, no chance usually, now they go to college, all of them. It's been, Rafe's been teaching for 22 years. But how can you replicate this? Is there a lesson to be learned in, in this? Because he has friends. Over the years, he's become famous. The, the Queen of England, the, the, the Royal House of England, is a, is a mentor, a, a, a patron of, of his classroom. Um, the White House is a patron of his classroom. Sir Ian McKellen, Michael York, a lot of people are interested. Oprah Winfrey are, are involved and have donated and have given him visibility. Can this be in some way modeled at a larger scale? The next project I took on looked at another maverick teacher by the name of Brad Kopenick, who uses filmmaking techniques and improvisational techniques to um, take kids on the autism spectrum out of their shells and to make them communicate, to help them communicate. And it was interesting because I had no idea. He's not a special ed teacher. I'm not a specialist. I was just interested. I liked these kids when I met them and I th wanted to make a movie about them. Um, what I've noticed at the end of this, and then talking to doctors and psychologists and parents, is that indeed, uh, practicing the arts and self-expression achieves some things that are essential for these kids. So neurotypical and non-neurotypical kids alike experience a lot of change, positive change, when they achieve self-expression abilities and skills, even though they don't necessarily end up being professionals, and many of them don't want to be professionals. Why would that be? As chance would have it, my next project dealt with what it looks like to have lived a life where you're, say, a housewife or a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer, but you have an artistic ability that you cultivated and that you kept up through life. The movie called They Came to Play is about the Van Calabro Amateur Piano Competition and some of the best 
uh, amateur pianists in the world. I'm going to let this play in the background because I have to respect the time limit. But it was clear to me after making this film that as far as age is concerned and as far as neurotypical and non-neurotypical students are concerned, it made a huge difference. This man is an ophthalmologist. He has four kids. He drives them to school every day. He's not... I mean, let's face it, in, in, in our country here, in Romania, uh, most likely this guy would have been concertizing. And he, at one point, could have, but he chose a different path and chose to be a family man and all that. Um, my next project after this, Shakespeare High, looked at a transversal, at a cross-section. This time, we looked at a variety of kids across a variety of... of, of um, social environments and economic backgrounds, looking again at a competition, at a festival really, of Shakespearean theater. Why Shakespeare? Why classical stuff? I have my own theory about that. I really don't think that there are, as far as the human experience is concerned, that many things in heaven and on earth, as Hamlet tells Horatio. Maybe there are more things in heaven and on earth that then are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. But in terms of the archetypes that inhabit us as humans, the, the stories that we're involved in when we love, when we lose, when we grow, when we die, these archetypes are limited in number. And what we call stories are just configurations of these archetypes. You have a, a certain man of a certain age, a hero archetype with a grandmother archetype, and whatever. You, you put in motion, every story you put in motion involves only these archetypes. We don't have other archetypes. We, we're not stones. We are human. And the classics, and in this particular case, Shakespeare, because of his linguistic and his musical abilities, have managed to incorporate and encapsulate these stories in a way that's easy to understand because it provokes emotion. And it saves the young mind, the young child, witnessing this story from the responsibility of having to make all those mistakes herself in order to understand them. It coats them in this beautiful, literally emotional, emotional pill that hopefully contains the lesson inside. And sure enough, in Shakespeare High, we notice uh, that across social and economic lines, these kids are vastly improved. Um, why is that? So after six years and four movies about arts and education, I did what every sensible filmmaker would do. I stopped and wondered what I was doing and why I was doing it. And um, a few things came to mind. Now, I got to make a disclaimer because the statements I'm about to make are general in nature and we know general statements don't usually work, but there are exceptions. There are schools like Chris Wink's Blue School, the co-founder of Blue Man Group, and Rudolf Steiner's Waldorf Schools, and many other schools. But generally, they're private schools who have taken to heart this model of surrounding children with beauty inside and out to teach them. But my opinion, from what I've read, from what I've seen, the majority of public school systems, public education systems worldwide, are derivative of a late 19th century East Prussian education model in, inaugurated by the blood and iron chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, which is a left brain, hierarchical approach, test-based. It's designed to create a pliant, pliable middle class divided nicely into blue collar, agricultural, industrial, and then workers, and then some engineers and some architects, and at the top, lawyers and doctors, and it, it created in a way where they disagree with each other and they're impossible to unite against, let's say, the ruling class, where they have predictable voting patterns, and where 
the jobs are predictable and conformism is the name of the game. Uh, this system obviously doesn't foster a lot of self-respect. Why? Well, 100% of the population of all the students compete in a number of disciplines. They have a number of finals, they have a number of competitions, athletic competitions, scientific competitions. Only 10 of them can win. But the name of the game in our society is winning. This system is, in a way, you could interpret it as breeding a majority of people who feel and think that they're losers. By contrast, when you practice art, whether uh, you do it professionally or not, when you learn to play a Bach invention, when you write a poem or read a poem, when you learn a new dance step, the satisfaction you get, not only is it building the self-esteem and lasting a lifetime, but it, it's not done at anyone else's expense, ever. Um, I'm not knocking the left brain approach at all because every major material lifestyle achievement and breakthrough has come through an engineering, a scientific uh, discovery or invention. But we do need to keep in mind that we do not have a competitive, we don't, we, not that we, do, we have a competitive world, but it's more and more clear that we need a collaborative mindset, that we have a global situation. And what we do have here is kids who have amazing media making abilities. Show of hands real quick. How many of you here have seen a 15 year old use a connectivity device or play a video game or a laptop at a speed and with a level of skill that made you feel embarrassed. Okay, you over there who didn't raise your hand, you lie. Um, what they have in, 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 in dexterity and speed, they lack in means and vision. That's what we have, right? In especially this kind of TED audience. So we have the responsibility to mentor them into gaining self-esteem through the practice of the art. They're already in the uh, global conversation. Steve Jobs and, and other people who, who, who made uh, smartphones didn't know they were being Marxists. But the essential, the fundamental idea of Marxism was the thing they were expecting and hoping and hoping it would someday, someday happen was the transference of the means of production into the hands of the people. Everyone who has one of these, or could get, get their hand on one of these, has the ability to make a movie, put titles, put subtitles, whatever, music, and p publish it to the web within minutes. Okay, it's not gonna be Avatar. But it's gonna be seen by millions of people, possibly on YouTube or Vimeo or something else, some other platform. Um, I want you to listen to the same thing being said much better by, by someone else. So let's play the last clip. It doesn't matter whether somebody wants to go into the arts or not. You know, if somebody wants to go into the arts, they're going to do it. You can't stop them. Somebody wants to be a dancer, or an actor, or a director, or a writer, they're going to do it. It's about what these kind of experiences, what these kind of programs, what this kind of education can do for somebody who doesn't go into the arts. I think it has to do with learning about collaborating, learning about confidence, learning about self-esteem, learning even maybe about how you view yourself. And that, to me, translates ultimately into how somebody presents themselves in the world no matter what job they have. I mean, let's face it, how many times have any of us been on the phone with a company or standing in line at a place and wishing to God the person we were dealing with had at some point in their life learned how to communicate a little better? Theater does that. Let me leave you with this thought. Let's not build a republic without poets. We have an educational system that segregates the brain. It's an apartheid of the brain. Kids who show artistic talent are put on a, on a track to become artists and they can't manage their, their um, checkbooks. Again, I'm, I'm generalizing here, so I apologize for the major exceptions. But the funny thing is, 
we worship those exceptions because the world belongs to ambi hemispherous people like Albert Einstein and his violin or Steve Jobs and his calligraphy or Leonardo da Vinci and his or Leonardo da Vinci as my favorite comedian Carl Gustav Jung once said okay you fell asleep yeah lunch is, is here is here I hear the chickens amazing um, the ocean the unconscious is like an ocean and in order for us to remember something because it's great if an idea is worth spreading but it's even better if it's worth remembering and remembering across these clashes of civilizations and, and cultures that we that archaeologists and anthropologists have shown us that that keep happening keep occurring you know every civilization that ever existed seems to have reached a point where they felt we are the shit we're just like wow we're perfect we're like gods the next thing that happened what's that big wave what's that disease what are those people with stones ow oh, stop it um no matter how perfect they felt they were they ended up perishing and it's almost like we can't remember every time civilization starts again from some sort of dark age it's usually through a left brain engineering driven point of view and philosophy or rather arts are the last thing or the marginal thing that develops and then seeps back into the middle and then the civilization perishes again can we remember something are we forgetting something are we possibly on the brink these are all legitimate questions but if you know about black swan theories you know that we don't ask these legitimate questions our brains are not really used to asking those questions and those of you who may be familiar with Ray Kurzweil's work and the, and the singularity know that between our progress making fools of our prophets every day and our inability to see the obvious there are some questions that we need to answer and I'm, I'm left thinking of uh, the modern artist Ed Ruscha who wrote um, it was a panel it's like a divider in a room and it was very fun because it had on one side it said I remember to forget to remember and on the other side it said I forgot to remember to forget so let's assume for a second that we want to plant an idea in our collective unconscious because if you're talking about awakening the giant of the power of arts education in our public where it matters number wise education systems you're talking about not just changing a mindset but changing an unconscious mindset how do you change something that's in your blind spot because the moment you look at it it moves and I'm gonna finish with this image by Jung of the ocean inside the ocean is the unconscious everything we can only express through art through magic through religion the sky rationality technology engineering repeatable facts proved things things we can build on the surface are the two conveyors imagine yourself floating face up you have your senses which send information from the conscious world into the unconscious and you have your intuition which sends information from the unconscious world from into the conscious and makes us make choices the only way to embrace and see and be conscious and be more aware think as if you want to see something in the periphery of your vision what do you do you unfocus your gaze completely you become aware of everything you sense you intuit and you let the right brain in thank you